Thank you, David. I want you all to think about hammer. Now, there are lots of different kinds of hammers, of course. Yeah, there are wooden mallets, there are rubber mallets, there are war hammers, you know, for combat. Short-handled ones used by the uh, cavalry, long-handled ones used by the infantry. All sorts of hammers with all sorts of purposes. But the hammer I'd like to think about at the moment is a very ordinary hammer, just a carpenter's core hammer, the sort that you probably all own. I would have brought one along myself as a visual aid, except that I don't live in Melbourne anymore, so I didn't have one at hand. But you all know the sort of implement I'm talking about. Think about the, the hammer, and imagine I am holding it, and I say, this is a good hammer. Okay, very simple exercise. What do I mean when I say that? Well, presumably what I mean when I say that is something like this. This tool that I'm holding, if I were holding one, is effective or efficient for the purpose that it has, which is driving <coughs> nails into the wood. Or perhaps it means that the tool has the properties or the features that make it effective for that purpose of driving nails into wood. <laughs> so this tool is now effective or efficient for its purpose of amplifying my voice and providing volume for my voice to the room, which it was done a moment ago. So everyone's with me. I've got you thinking about this ordinary carpenter's claw hammer. If I say it's a good hammer, presumably I mean something like it has whatever features are required in such a tool to be effective or efficient for the purpose for which it's used or designed or for which we need it or require it or want it. Now what are those features? I assume they're going to be features like yeah, the, the head is sufficiently hard that when you hit the nail it actually drives the nail rather than just denting or something. The construction is such that the handle's not just going to fall off the head or vice versa. I don't know that much about carpentry really. I'm pretty useless um, even hanging up you know, pictures on the wall. But you know, I, I guess having used these sorts of hammers enough in my time, it needs a certain balance. There are features that we could probably agree, or at least people who are skilled in carpentry could probably agree are the features that you need to have. You know, a good hammer of this kind. A hammer that does actually have those properties that will enable it to be efficient and effective for the purpose that we're talking about. Okay, think of a knife. Once again, there are lots of kinds of knives, right? There are knives for spreading butter, there are knives for cutting bread, there are knives for carving meat, and they're all different. There are military knives, there are knives that are used by hunters, all kinds of knives with different kinds of construction. And I could ask you to think about any of those if I wish to. I didn't bring along a visual aid once again. But think about the kind of knife that you might use for carving off thin slices of meat from, I don't know, say a leg of lamb or something. Now, if I have a tool like that, a kitchen utensil of that kind, and I hold it up and I say, yeah, this is a good carving knife, well, what do I mean by that? Presumably, I mean something like this. It has whatever properties or features are required to be efficient or effective for the purpose of which people are likely to use it, namely carving meat. It's going to have to be yeah, sharp enough to carve through meat in thin slices. It's going to have to be, once again, robust enough that it doesn't fall apart. I probably want a knife that's going to last well. There are probably various features that could be agreed upon by people who are skilled with using such utensils. Here I'm dropping my paper everywhere. Please edit that out if anybody's taking video. <laughs> uh, if you have a device that's useful for the purpose of doing so or and, and for editing it to make the speaker look better than he actually is. People who are skilled with using such an instrument could probably reach pretty good agreement on what properties or features are required for it to be effective or efficient for the purpose for which it's used. Okay. 
So we can make perfectly rational judgments about good and bad, hammers, good or bad, knives, and other such instruments that we use for various purposes uh, that meet our needs and requirements. Think about, let's take a hard example. Think about a motor car. Now again, there are many kinds of motor cars. There are, for example, you know, Formula One racing cars. But I just want you to think about an ordinary motor car, ordinary on-road vehicle, such as you might use to drive to the Atheist Society at the Unitarian Church Hall. You, know, you might use to transport yourself and others around. And you, know, you can imagine that car, I have such a car parked out there, it's a current model Honda Civic Sport. Um, I recently traded in my long faithful to me Honda Integra. I've been, I've been sticking with Honda because I think Honda's pretty good, it's been pretty good to me. But yeah, different people have different views about what is a good motor car. But there are probably various criteria you could use for perfectly rational, non arbitrary criteria. So think about what amounts to a, a good motor car. Now you might think that a good motor car would be one that has, well, good performance, what good performance means in that context, but performance of a car that's going to be suitable for driving on our modern sort of roads. So you're going to want the car to be able to have enough power to drive up hills of the kind you're likely to encounter, or to you know, overtake when necessary, perhaps in spots that don't have to be tighter than you touch in the first place. You know, there's a certain amount of power needs to be able to brake you know, pretty well, where well means you know, stopping uh, you know, fast enough so you don't get things that you've seen. Um, issues of performance when driving around corners, you know, you want stability. So there are all sorts of performance issues. There are other issues, issues maybe with styling, though people can disagree about what that amounts to. Issues about things like fuel economy might be one of your criteria. You might think about comfort. There may be a whole range of things that you think about. Interestingly enough, that different people are going to come to different conclusions about what is a good car. You know, some people are going to think that fuel economy is more important than you know, power for overtaking. Some people are going to think comfort is more important than either. Everyone might agree that all of these things are important, but some people might even think that some of these things are not very important at all. Some of them might not care that much about comfort or might not care that much about performance as long as it reaches a minimal level. It becomes a non-trivial task to work out what is a good car. I think we can all agree it's a much more difficult task with something as versatile as a motor car than it is with something that has a clear uh, purpose which is constructed such as a carpenter's claw hammer or a knife for carving meat. Nonetheless, it is quite possible to have perfectly rational arguments about what's a good car and what's a bad car. Perfectly rational discussion. Now, there are obvious things that you would point to if you were having a discussion like that. Things like fuel economy, reliability, performance, styling, even that in that be a further sub-argument about what that really means, and so on. But the arguments are perfectly rational. And at no stage does anyone have to say, well, God agrees with or nature itself or the universe agrees with me. You can have perfectly rational arguments which are based upon things like the kind of needs, purposes and so on that people have in a motor car. Right? Think about a friend that you have. Think about someone you consider a good friend. Now, you might also uh, just hold that thought, but at the same time you might think of someone that has been a bad friend to you or that you see as having been a bad friend to, to others. And think about what it is you want in a friend. Why do you consider some people to be you know, good friends? Not just good in the sense that they're close or they've been a friend for a long time or whatever, but someone that you think is a good person to have as a friend and you've made this person as your friend. And you want to have people like that as your friends. Now, again, this is going to get a lot more complicated than thinking about a you know, good, well put together claw hammer or a knife. 
I suggest to you that it might not be that much more difficult than thinking about something as versatile and varied <coughs> as Jesus and motor car. It might be more difficult. It might not be that much more difficult. There are probably things that you want in a friend. Uh, you probably want a friend to be a sort of person that's loyal, for example. Yeah, there are probably certain dispositions of character that you want in a friend. Uh, loyalty might be one of them, kindness might be another. Um, because after all, with loyalty, you, know, you want someone who will not kind of cast you aside easily. You want someone who will stand up for you if you're in trouble. Yeah, there's probably certain things that you need from a friend. We all need friends, don't we? And although it might be quite vague and in inchoate exactly what we need them for, we do need friends. And we can at least, in a fairly general way, reach agreement upon why we need friends and what amounts to a person who's a, you know, who's a good friend. It has the qualities that we want in a friend. Again, we are not going to reach complete agreement on this because people can have arguments about it, but there may be no end to those arguments. And yet they can be perfectly rational arguments. When you say, I want my friends to be loyal and uh, you know, have some common interests with me and so on, you're not just stating arbitrary requirements. You know, these are perfectly rational requirements to have, given what we want from our friends. So the, the value judgments we make, and by the way, the title's actually meant to be living in a world without objective values. That was what I actually wanted it to be. Um, the value judgments we're making are perfectly rational value judgments when we're talking about friends or motor cars, just as they are with the claw handler and the, the carving knife. Yet there's not a strict dichotomy between, on the one hand, saying it's purely a matter of arbitrary taste, and on the other hand, saying God's got to be on my side here, or the universe itself has to back me up. We can make non arbitrary judgments about these things because there are things that we, as human beings, quite you know, rationally and reasonably, expect from a friend. Think about a fellow citizen. What counts as a good fellow citizen? I think that's a, probably going to be even more difficult than any of the examples we've thought of so far. And it may be that it's ultimately contested, as it may be with friends. Different people want slightly different things from friends. Some are good big emphasis on the friends standing up for them when they're in trouble. Other people might put a big emphasis on being able to enjoy their company because there's common interests, right? And there may be no absolute right and wrong as to which of those people is correct. When you get to the citizen, what do you want from fellow citizens? Well, one thing might be you want them to make some sort of economic contribution to the society, at least to the extent that they're able. You know, you might acknowledge that there'll be times when people are not able because of disability or or you know, difficulty finding jobs and so on, but you might want people who are at least prepared to make some kind of productive contribution. You might want them at least to be prepared to solve you know, problems and disputes that arise for them in a non-violent way so that society is not disrupted. There may be some fairly minimalist requirements that everyone could agree upon, but there may be other things that can't be agreed upon. And yet, even though this may get somewhat vague and inchoate, and contested, uh, and quite rationally contested, you can have a perfectly sensible discussion about what amounts to a good citizen, what it really is that you want from your fellow citizens, and what kinds of dispositions of character and you know, ways of acting fellow citizens you know, have. And again, if I say quite rationally that what I expect from my fellow citizens and what features of what they have include some disposition to, you know, to put work in and make some kind of contribution to the society and to act in such a way that they resolve their problems without violence. So if I start saying things like that, that's perfectly rational and non-arbitrary. I don't need to say, and God agrees with me, or somehow the universe itself agrees with me. 